to you guys. Um, I was at the library a couple weeks ago and um, I was uh, walking around the science section, the public library uh, close to my house, and there was a book by a physicist. Um, I think his last name is Weinberg, I'm not sure. Um, there was a chapter on equations and um, he had an interesting comment. He said that um, cathedrals are basically are linked to the past when we think about um, um, architecture. So, you know, if you want to know something about what life was like three, four hundred, five hundred years ago, when you visit a remnant of life from that time, architecture is often one of the things that's left behind. So, you know, when you go to a cathedral or any other public building um, or palace or something that was built, you have a link to the time when that, you know, era expressed itself toward Toward, uh, by, by building something. And he said that um, equations are kind of like that to uh, scientists because great equations, what they do is that they provide you with a link to the past because at the time when the person wrote that equation, some human being wrote some equation, they had some idea about what they were applying it to. And it may turn out that, you know, in the years and centuries later, that it no longer applies to that because it's, it's perhaps not really a part of that. Like, for example, Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations were written, if you read the original paper, he's talking about ether. And so, you know, you know, we don't talk about ether anymore when we think about physics, but Maxwell's equations were written in that time frame when ether was the general knowledge of describing of how uh, physical things interacted with each other through this thing called ether. But nevertheless, the Maxwell's equations still apply today because they describe some physically real thing that Maxwell himself perhaps wasn't thinking about, but they applied to it. So, yeah, what I liked about that, uh, that chapter in his book was this concept of how great equations are, are um, linked to the past. And uh, in science, great equations are rare things. So, today we're going to see another great equation. I think um, we've learned one great equation, which has been the idea of the, that Coleman had in the um, very late part of the fifth decade of the 20th century. And that led to the concept of describing state estimation as a way to minimize posterior uncertainty. Today we're going to see an equation that came about 10 years or so later from uh, Bellman that describes the idea of how to um, find a policy. Meaning that how do you find commands that in the long term will minimize some cost, some maximization of some, uh, uh, some overall value. And uh, the, the idea of coming up with a policy is based on the notion that it, it, it makes sense to have a way to respond to the states around you so that if you find yourself at this state, you do something differently than this state. And both of them are the best you could do in order to arrive at whatever goal that you have. So you have some long-term goal and you don't want to describe your actions from where you are now to the future because who knows, there might be perturbations, there may be uncertainties. So what you want to do is to not describe all the actions but you want to describe a policy. A policy is a way to think about how do you respond to a state. So if you find yourself here, what's the best command you could give? If you find yourself here, what's the best command you could give? So it's a feedback controller that we're going to be describing. We have a long-term goal. We find ourselves here. What's the best policy that we could do from here on in order to arrive at our um, destination? So a policy is more like um, a way, if you, if you want to think about it in the colloquial term, you know when they say honesty is the best policy? Well, what they mean isn't that honesty at this particular state is the best policy. Is that it's the best policy, you know, in some general way of thinking no matter where you find yourself. So the way we're going to be thinking about um, control in the framework that we've been describing is as follows. So um, we have, so today's lecture is going to cover chapter 12.1 and 12.2 and in particular I'm going to cover a, a document that I wrote to help you with understanding the Bellman equation that's on the web page. It's just called, I think, Bellman equation or something like that. It's a four page or so um, document. You should look at it. It's, it's unfortunately not in your book. So 
Um, we have we have some costs that we want to minimize. Let's see if I can find a good pen. No. So for example, we might say that at the end of the movement, what we want is that from the beginning to the end, from um, k is equal to 0 to k is equal to p, we want to have minimization of some kind of a cost. Maybe what, what I want to do is to get there as effortlessly as possible. So k trans u transpose um, l u of k, sum of all the commands that I produced, plus what matters to me is to be as close to the goal as possible. So the state at the end of my movement, x of at time point p, should be as close to this goal as possible. So something like this. Maybe uh, this would be my effort cost. Let's call it ju. This would be my state cost. Let's call it jx, state cost. You know, I want to be in Bahamas. And the closer I am to Bahamas, the better it is. I want to get there with as little effort as possible. So something like this. We begin with something that we want to minimize, the accumulation of uh, some, some kind of a cost. And then what we have is we have a model of how our actions changes our state. So we believe that you know, our, our state is going to change based on some model that maybe looks like this. Some kind of noise at the end of my model. Maybe something like this. I could also have you know, um, different kinds of noises here. And, and then I have some sensory system that measures these states. So this is what we call a forward model. So I can predict, if I produce some action, what's going to happen. And then what I have is a way to um, <coughs> estimate my state. Where am I? So what I do with this is that I have a prior belief about where I am. I make a prediction about um, what should happen if I generate some input u. And then I make some observation y. And so what I get is that I have a posterior belief that looks at the observation that I made minus my prediction about what should have been made. And this is my, you know, my common gain. And then finally, what I need to do is to actually generate, generate command u in such a way so that over the long term, I can minimize this cost. And so my, my u is going to be some function of um, uh, um, my belief about where I am, my prior belief about where I am, and Something that's going to transform this into my motor commands g, g sorry u. Let's call this this in the case of the this particular cost and this particular um, linear dynamical system. This is going to be a linear transformation, and this is going to be my feedback control policy. And what we're after is this this equation. What's the way to transform your belief about where you are? Two motor commands u in such a way that you minimize over the long term the cost. How should you how should you do this? So what we have is the problem of having accumulation of some cost. We find ourselves at some state and we want to minimize over the long term this cost. And the idea is to find a feedback control policy, something that says you tell me where you think you are, and I will tell you the best commands to produce in order to minimize this cost. So what, we, what we're after is this matrix G. Now, that's for linear systems. You would get a linear transformation. Today what I'm going to do is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the problem in a nonlinear system, but small enough so we can get our hands around it. So in principle, you're going to understand basically how does this Spellman equation work? How do we find the transformation from the state to 
the, the commands u. So that's, that's the basic idea. Any, any questions before I get into it? All right, so let me give you some examples of why, why this kind of thing is reasonable. Um, uh, we've been talking about saccades, which are basically movements of your eye. And so, you know, a typical saccade, position of your eye versus time, might look something like this, where this is on the order of maybe 100 milliseconds. So oftentimes, when you move your eyes, what happens is that you blink as you move your eyes. So I'm looking, I move my eyes over there, and if I do it while I'm blinking, what happens is that something that pushes down on my eye. So this action is like a perturbation. Your eyelids, when they fall on your eye, they are pushing it down. And um, what one can do is we can put contact lenses that have a coil around them, and you sit in this magnetic chamber, and the position of your eye is sensed by this little wire on your eyes. And so when you move your eyes, despite the fact that it's under your lid, you can measure its position. So what happens then is that if you have a blink, a blink looks like this, where your eyelid is closed for a moment, it pushes on your eyes. And if you look at what happens to your eye, your eye goes up and does this. So it gets perturbed. But what's interesting is that it corrects. Some mechanism in your brain corrects for that perturbation. And the reason, we think, is because this isn't some unexpected perturbation that's acting on your eye. You blinked. So it wasn't like you know, me pushing down on your eyes. It was you yourself. You're moving your eyes, and some part of your brain says, close your eyelid. And so it somehow can compensate for this perturbation. And so this idea is that even on the course of 100 milliseconds, which is too short of a time to have sensory feedback, the sensory feedback, if, you, if all you had was sensory feedback from your eye muscles to tell you that your eye got perturbed, 100 milliseconds would be too short for you to respond to it and correct it. But if you yourself generate this action, then some part of your brain says, wait, there's this motor commands that are being sent. This is going to have a consequence, and I can respond to it. I can correct it, because I can monitor these commands and say, ah, there's going to be something that's acting on my app. So here's an example of feedback control. It's not just some motor commands that are generated to your eye, and they are blind to everything else that happens around you. If something perturbs the eye, the nervous system responds to it. Um, another example of this is uh, something that we did um, sort, of, sort of like this. Um, but instead of, uh, instead of uh, having people blink, what we did is that we were using um, stimulation of the brain. So what you could do is that you could give a pulse to anywhere, pretty much anywhere on the brain, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So you take this coil, and you place it on the head someplace, and you go zap. And if people are saccading, right around the time that that zap takes place, it appears to engage startle reflexes. And startle reflexes are complicated on if, if, if they're given considerably before a movement, it makes it so that people jump. But if you're giving it the startle thing during a movement, it seems to make the, that movement inhibited. So it makes it look like, basically, your saccades are going to have a motion that the eye begins moving, and then it can come down almost to a stop, and then it can correct itself. So this is with TMS. This is with eyelid closing. So I, I give you these examples because they're important from the point of view of demonstrating that the brain has mechanisms in place that monitors and corrects for actions that your derm being produced. And it tells you that even the fastest of all movements, saccades, they're under feedback control. Okay, so this feedback control is, is, is what we're going to be studying. Feedback control, what that means is that actions that you produce depend on your estimates of state, where they are. They're not just some sequence of actions that are programmed from beginning to end. It depends on where you believe you are, and you generate a different feedback depending on where your body is. 
final example of this that I want to show you is uh, something about the way you move your eyes naturally. So usually you don't just move your eyes, you also move your head with it. So when I'm, when I'm looking from here to here, I move both my eyes and my head. The way that works is as follows. So if you look at the way most people move their eyes from one location to another, they move their eyes and then their eyes come back as their head rotates. And this makes it the sum of these two is called gaze is where you're looking at. So usually your eyes are centered in your head. So when I'm looking to the left, the eyes are almost centered at, the, at my head. When I'm looking to the right, the eyes are centered in my head. But when I move my eyes from place to place, like this, what happens is that first my eyes get there, then my head gets there, and as my head is moving, my eyes rotate back. Okay, so in the 70s, my former mentor, Emilio Bizzi, he did this experiment where in monkeys, he, he, he looked at what would happen when the animal is about to make a movement and he wouldn't let the head rotate. So the eyes would rotate, but the head on random trials was maintained in its position. So usually the monkey wants to move his head, but the head doesn't move in those cases. So you can imagine a little thing that holds the head down. The brake is applied, the head doesn't move. And so what happens is that in that scenario, the eye goes up and stays up until the head is released. Then the eyes come back. So it's again a feedback system until the eyes and the head the eyes by themselves isn't just some commands being sent to the eyes that says, okay, move your eyes there and then bring it back. No, it depends on where the head is. The commands to the head, if they didn't cause any movement of the head, then what happens is that the animal waits until the head moves and then the eyes come back. So the commands to the eyes are not just set in motion and then they, they go on by themselves. They depend on what's happening to the head. So that's the state here. This state is the state of the head and the eye. And so this command is only relevant, is only going to be the same, basically. It's going to let the eyes come back only if the head has been allowed to move. Okay. So what we're interested in is how does these gains look like? You know, how do we divide up these gains? And, and the way you can think about it is that when you have redundancy, so we always have redundancy, right? For example, um, we have many muscles in our body, we have many neurons. And um, one of the redundancies that we talked about last time was that suppose that you have um, two, um, two effectors, one arm, the other arm, these two arms. And so you can imagine that, well, if you are doing something that depends on both arms, well, then the feedback gain should make it so that when I need to respond to something, if I can help with this arm, I should respond with both arms. Because if, if, if you push my right arm, and my objective is to maintain some location here, then some of the response, say maybe, maybe I'm, I'm the, the position of this thing that I'm holding is a sum of the right and the left arm. So if you just push on my right arm, if I just respond with my right arm, say you push me with one Newton. If I respond with one Newton back, that's fine. But if I respond half a Newton here, half a Newton here, if each arm does half a Newton and the together they produce one Newton, then the effort is lower, right? So because half a Newton squared plus half a Newton squared is less than one. Does that make sense? So my feedback gain would be such that it would say, despite the fact that this got perturbed, I'm going to respond with both of them. Because that's the best way to minimize that kind of a cost. So that's the nature of what we're after. What we're after is you know, say that I have a state described by position of my head and position of my eye. The objective is to make the sum of these two equal to the gaze. That's the cost. I want the gaze to be on the target. And now, if you, you know, hold the head in one trial, what happens is that the eyes move there and they don't come back down. On the other hand, if you don't hold the head, then one moves there and the other one moves there later and the two get aligned. So this this thing tells us that if we could build a feedback control that does that, then you know, it is, it's much more complicated, of course, but it sounds like it would be more interesting than something that says, just generate these commands to the eye, generate these commands to the head, and that's it. That, our objective is to go after this feedback controller. And what we want to do is to minimize some kind of a cost that looks like this. 
Okay, any questions? All right, let me show you how to do it. So typically what we have is what's called cost per unit, of cost per step. And so for example, in the cost that I wrote up there, what I have is, let's call this alpha, cost per step, at time step k is equal to u at time step k times l u of k plus, in that case, my cost is only at the end point. So it only, only gives me a cost at the, as, as I've run out of time. But in principle, I could have something like this. x at time point k transpose t at time point k x at time point k. So I took out the g because you know, that doesn't really matter. It's just a constant. And really what you can do is to, you, can, you can incorporate g into x so just to give you a sense of things. So for example, my state, it could be you know, my position, my velocity, my whatever you want. But if it's a, if it, let's say if it's a second order state. And let's second order system. And then I could put, I could put the goal in here. My state could be the goal as well. That's a state. And so then if I'm interested in representing that equation, I can just put t in such a way that it finds a subtraction between this and this, the ca that matrix t. So g and sub isn't very interesting. You can always incorporate that into the state. All right, so and, and this t has a superscript k because you know in some scenarios, there's only a cost at the end. So all the other t's are 0, and t is not 0 at the end. But in principle, you could have a cost per step for the state. Okay, so this is, a, this is a more general way of writing that cost. This is cost per step. Okay? All right. So what we want to do is, first of all, assume a finite horizon. What this means is that our cost is going to run, total cost is the sum of k is equal to 0 to p of alpha k, meaning that p is the end. There's some time point at which we're going to be done. That's called finite horizon. So the kind of problems that we're going to be considering are called finite horizon optimal control. Now, remember that on Wednesday, I suggested to you that time itself is interesting. Why should it, something end at 100 milliseconds, right? So I suggested that there's another kind of a cost that's a cost of time. So that would be adding onto this cost. And you would then get a cost for a particular p. So you say, all right, let's assume that my movement should be only 300 milliseconds. What's the optimum thing that I can do? And let's now find it for 400 milliseconds. Let's find it for 300 milliseconds. And you'll see what's the best time as well. So for now, let's assume that p is constant. We're not going to change it. And we're going to have two kinds of um, costs in our cost per step. There's going to be an effort cost, and there's going to be a state cost. And the problem that we're considering is, belongs to this class called finite horizon. So um, now what I want to do is uh, find the policy such that you know my policy is going to be u of k is going to be some policy pi of x of k. So you find yourself at some x at time point k. You're going to produce some action that's going to be called pi. And, and this pi could be nonlinear. You know, up there I wrote it linearly, but in principle it could be nonlinear function of this, this state. And the objective is to find this optimum policy that finds the u that minimizes this sum of alpha k, k is equal to 0 to p. OK, that's the problem statement. So how do we do it? Let me give you intuition about how this is going to work. We're going to begin at the end of the our time, the last time point, p. So we've run out of time. We're going to have a value associated with the states at the end. That's going to be basically our cost. 
The farther away we are from our goal, the worse it is. That's pretty simple. Now we're going to say, step back one time point. Step back to time point P minus 1. At that time point, whatever actions you take is going to carry a cost. That cost is going to be this cost per step. However, the result of that action is going to be a state that you're going to achieve. That state is going to have a value associated with it. And the question is, how do you find the policy, which is the motor command, that minimizes the sum of step that you've taken plus where you ended up? And so if you find that policy that minimizes that sum, which is the sum of the step cost plus where you ended up, that's the optimum policy. Then you step back two points and you say, find the, the best motor command that minimizes this and so forth. And so the Bellman equation is a way to take our problem, which is all of these time points, and we're going to begin at the end and then find for each step the optimum action. And we're going to see that produces a sum that's the best policy. So, um, let me see, what do I, how, do, how am I going to write it down for you? So, all right, let's, let's begin at time point P. So, the last time point. And if we begin at the last time point, we've run out of time. So our only cost is going to be this. Any action that we produce is irrelevant because there's, there's nothing to be gained by our action. So the minimum of this function is going to be, you know, produce no actions at all. And whatever state that I have is going to be the, um, uh, the cost that I'm going to end up with. So um, suppose that uh, uh, I produce pi star of x of time point p is equal to 0. I'm not going to do anything because Whatever I do is going to cost me something. And then what I end up with, the value of this policy at x of p is just going to be the x of p transpose t x of p. So wherever, whatever state that I'm in, that's going to be the value associated with it. Um, so at time point k is equal to p minus 1. What's the best thing that I can do? Well, whatever actions I perform, they're going to carry a cost. This is going to be the cost here. And so the u that I'm going to produce is going to be cost per step. It's going to be my first thing that I'm going to, it's going to cost me. Whatever u I produce is going to cost me something. And so that's going to be the um, alpha at time point p minus 1, which is going to be the action that I do at this time point, plus whatever state I'm in. So at, at, at time point p minus 1, I'm at some state. This is the action that I will produce is how much this is going to cost me. Now, that action results in a change in my state. I end up going to some other state. So I get, as a consequence of this action, to a new state. As a consequence of u of p minus 1, I go to x of p, right? Some state I'm going to end up with. And this this place that I end up at is going to have a value. And that value is going to be this. The goodness of this state, how good is it? That goodness of the state is associated with the value function. What is this value function? It is the best action that I could produce that would produce basically the minimum of this value. So the state is going to have a value, and that value is going to be associated with the optimum policy. Yeah? What's the units of that value? It's a scalar quantity that's described by, we just saw what, so this value 
is associated with a policy, and at this, so this is the policy to do nothing, and at this state, it's going to have this value, just a scalar quantity. So, for, no, 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 right, right. So for right, this policy, policy that gives, so, this is the cost so what is the policy? The policy is do nothing. Mm -hmm. What is the value of that policy for this state? It is this. So it's like alpha k evaluated. Exactly, okay. exactly. So a policy is something that tells us what we should do at any state. The value of the policy is at a given state, what is the cost? So look at, look at what I wrote. My policy at the last time point is to do nothing. But it could be something else. Whatever it is, the value of that policy is described as a number. And that number tells us how good is that policy at this particular state. So you know, this, this action is gonna, can take me anywhere and in each of those places, I'm going to have a number. We'll do an example so you'll see what this looks like. Yeah. How is um, T, K yeah. um, related to the T and the cost function of the quarter? The one up there? Yeah. Yeah. So the one up there is only at the end point. There's only one location for it, so it doesn't have a superscript. Here, I could have a different cost at different times. But is that the same as T of P? This, this one here? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, at the end, it would be T of P. So you could have a cost that says, you know, the state at the end is, is, is going to have some quadratic cost. So I, I want to be as close as possible to the center and the farther I am. But I could also have a cost associated with states at different times. In principle, it doesn't just have to be at the end. Okay. So, all right. So as a consequence of generating this action, I'm going to go to some state. And when I get to that state, what I have is... Um, this probability of x of p given that I was at p minus 1 and I produced action p minus 1. So this is a probability that says where I'm going to go given that I was here and I did that action. Okay, so in a stochastic system, you generate some action, but there's some probability associated with where you're going to go. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply this times the value of the optimum policy at that position, x of p. So you generate action u. That alters your state. But the alteration of the state is probabilistic. You might go here, 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 all these places. Each one of those places has a value. Think of it as a as a, as a game board. Each position on the game board has a value. And your actions changes your state to one of those places. Now, if it's a probabilistic thing, then you know it's 90% likely that when I move my piece from here to here, it's actually going to go there. But it's also possible let's go to someplace neighboring states. And so the value of each one of those states is going to be weighted by the probability of actually getting to that state. So this is how good is the state to get to? How good is the state? Well, so obviously, if I get to the goal, that's great. That's a great state to be in, right? But there's neighboring states that I might have gotten to. How good are those? Well, there's a value associated with it. This is the probability of actually getting to those states given this action, right? OK, so what we want to do is we want to say, this is the value of this, of this state. This is the probability of getting to that state. You know, we want to sum, sum that up over all of these states, dx of p. And then what I want to do is I want to find the policy that minimizes alpha at p minus 1 plus this. So I want to find the u arg min u that minimizes the sum 
This is my best action, my U star. So look what I did. I said, this is my cost per step. I produce some action. So this is, this is where I am. I'm, I'm at some state. I produce some action, U. It's going to take me to some other state with some probability. Each one of those states is going to have a value. And I want to find the action that minimizes this cost. OK, let's do an example so you can get a sense of what I'm talking about. This is the expected value. This is the expected value of this, of this function, right? Because it's multiplying the probability by this value function. This is the Bellman equation. It says the best action that you can do is a function of the cost per step plus the weighted sum of the values, assuming that from then on, everything that you do is optimal. Let me do an example for you. Suppose that our cost per step, we write it like this, Jx plus Ju. And suppose I have a world that has the following behavior. So suppose that I have a um, four by three grid. These are positions on a board. And what I can do at each one of these positions, I can perform the following actions. I could move down, I could move up, I can move to the right, I can move to the left, I can move sideways or diagonally and so forth. So there's a wall here, so that means that the only thing I can do here is to move down. This point I can move up or down. This point I can move up or down. This I can move to the right. I can move diagonally over to this position and so forth. So these are the, these are the actions that I can do. These are the states. So what are my costs? My costs are as follows. So this is my J of X. Regardless of the position I'm in, it's going to cost me 5, except this point, where it's going to cost me nothing. So that's my goal. Yeah, it's just for to, just today's example. Yeah. So what about the cost of action, JUU? That's equal to 1, no matter what action I take, if I move 0, if I stay. What I want is a policy of x that minimizes this sum. And we're going to use the Bellman equation to do it. So let's begin at the end. So we're going to begin at k is equal to p, at the last time point. And at the last time point, my best action is to do nothing, since I've run out of time. And I have, for each time point, some uh, uh, some value function that uh, I would like to describe. So um, I guess I guess I should first write down the value that uh, what happens at time point k. All right. So all right. Let, let's let's write it like this. So my best action at time point p is going to look like this. Do nothing. What's the value? of this at time point P.
Well, that value is going to be jx plus ju. So for this point, I didn't move. It's just going to be jx. It's just going to be this. The value of this policy, here's my policy. What to do at every state. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit there. I'm not going to move. The value of that policy is going to be equal to this. Jx plus Ju. Ju is 0. Jx is just this. OK? All right. Time point p minus 1. Let's consider one of these points. Let's consider this point here. So I'm going to consider this point, this state. Let's consider some actions. Suppose I do nothing. Suppose I do this. What's going to happen is that I'm going to have a cost per step, which is going to be equal to alpha of k, which is going to be equal to the cost of u, which is 0. And then that's going to have a cost of state, jx, which is going to be equal to 5, this cost here, right? jx plus ju. I, I, I chose to do nothing, so that's 0. I'm going to have a cost of state, 5. Now, where is this state going to take me if I do nothing? It's going to stay where it is. So what is the value of the optimum policy at that point? It's 5. So alpha at p minus 1 plus value of the optimum policy at x of p is going to be equal to 5 plus 5, which is equal to 10. If I do nothing, that's the cost that I incur per step plus the optimum policy. That's if I do nothing. OK, what if I move down? So if I do this, then what I get is alpha k is equal to, it's going to cost me 1 to move, plus the cost of state that, um, that I'm at, where I start from, is 5. Right? So this. Jx of k plus u of k, uk, uh, ju of k, this is 5. Now, now what I have is um, alpha of p minus 1. Um, yeah, let me write this as p minus 1 as well. So where do I end up going? V of, that's equal to 6 plus, I end up at this state, right? If I go down, I end up at this state. What's the value of this state? It is 0. So that's 6. Let me go over that again. I chose at time point p minus 1 to do nothing. What's the cost of that action? That action is going to have a cost associated with the state that you start from and the action that you do. The state that you start from has a cost of 5, because that's where I'm starting from. The action that I do carries a cost of 1. That's 1. 5 plus 1 is 6. Where does it take you to? It takes me to this point. What's the value? of that state under the optimum policy. The value of that state under optimum policy is 0. So that's 6 plus 0 is equal to 6. That's the value of the policy that I chose. So this v of pi at x of p minus 1 is this. This is the value of that policy at time point p minus 1. This is a better policy than this. Why? Because this cost here is more than this. What if I move to the right? Move the right. Do this. The cost that I start from, alpha at p minus 1, is I have a cost for my movement, 1. I have a cost for my state, 5. And then I end up to a new location. This new location is going to have v of x of p is going to be equal to 5. 
So the value of my policy at time point x of p minus 1 is going to be equal to 10. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, sorry, 11. Thank you. Right. Okay. So if I stay, do nothing, the value of my policy is 10. If I move down, the value of my policy is 6. If I move to the right, the value of my policy is 11. So what the Bellman equation says is pi star is the policy that minimizes alpha at time point p minus 1 plus the value of the policy, the optimum policy of the state that you go to at time point p. And in this case, the one that minimizes it is at time point k minus 1, If I'm at this state, the best policy that I can have is the one that moves me down here. That's better than going to the right or better than going down. Better, to, better than staying still. Okay, so and, and what is what is the value of this policy at the state x of p minus 1? So there's going to be some number here. This number is going to be uh, 6. There's going to be some number there, some number there, some number there, some number there. So I will figure these out in a moment. But I'm just going to put them as blank for now. I'm going to have to compute these things. But the best policy at time point x, point x p minus 1 has a value of 6, which is a sum of the actions, costs, plus the optimal policy that it takes you to. So this is my pi star at x of p minus 1. This is the value of that policy. All right, let me do another one for you. So suppose that I'm, I'm interested in this time point, this, this, this state there. What's the best action for that, this state over here? So I could do nothing, in which case my alpha at time point p minus 1 is going to be equal to 0 plus 5, which is the, 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 the state cost. Right, so that's just 5. And where do I end up? Well, I end up where, I'm, where I stay. So I get alpha p minus 1. So the value of under the optimum policy of x at time point p is going to be equal to up there, it's 5. So the sum is going to be equal to 10. That's if I do nothing. What if I move down from that state? If I'm at this state, what if I move down? So here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to move down. So now what happens is that alpha at p minus 1 is going to be 1 plus 5, which is 6, right? 5 is the state value to begin with. 1 is the cost of the movement. And the, where do I end up? I end up in the state below it. And that state has a value of 5. So the sum of these two is what? What's the value of moving down? 11. So what's better for me, to stay or move down? It's to stay. It costs me more to move down. So this state is to stay. And if I do stay, the value at time point p minus 1 is going to be 10. That's the optimum policy for that. Why is it that it's better for me to stay? 
because it's hopeless. I cannot get to the goal. I might as well stay. Performing an action does not improve my state. See, there's no difference between the value of this state and this state. There's no difference in there. So why should I move? It makes no difference anyway. I'm going to run out of time. So, the policy, the best policy for this point is to stay, not to move. It's going to be the same for this. This is going to be 10 as well. All of these far away places, it's best to do nothing. All right, let's consider, and it, and it turns out, you know, it, let us consider this one here, the, the goal state. What's the best policy there? So let, let's consider this point here. Um, suppose I decide, so here, I'm interested in this state. State row two column, um, uh, column two. So let me label these. Say this is, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. So I'm interested in the state associated with row two, column two. So um, if I decide to stay, I have alpha p minus one is equal to zero plus um, the value associated with uh, uh, that state, which is zero. And then I have v, where I end up under the optimal policy. So if I stay, I'm just going to stay where at this location. So that's going to be equal to the value of that, that, that state under the optimal policy is zero. So alpha p minus one plus value under the optimal policy of x of p is zero. So the best thing to do is stay, obviously. If you're there, you don't want to move. No big deal. So, and if I do so, this is zero. These other states are going to be very similar to this. So let me do this one here for you, for example. This, this state here. Um, so let's do state row 1, column 3. If I stay, I have the cost of staying, alpha p minus 1, is going to be 0 plus the cost of the, uh, the state is 5. And then I have the value under the optimum policy of x of p where I end up. And that's going to be equal to 5 as well. So this is 10 if I stay. If I move, in particular, if I move to the goal with a single act like this, my alpha at p minus 1 is going to be 1 plus 5. My value function at the state that I end up at is going to be 0. So this is going to be 6. So similar to this, the optimum thing to do is to move to the goal. And if I do that, the value of that policy is 6. And it turns out this is the case here as well. 6, 6, 6. And here's the action. So all right. If I'm near, if I'm one step away from the goal and I have one time point left, what I should do is move to the goal. What about out here? Let's, let's pick this one here. So let's do row um, four, column three. Let's see what that turns out. So if I were to stay, I get alpha at p minus 1 is equal to 0 plus 5. The state is going to have a cost, 5. Action is going to have a cost, 0. And where I end up with is v at pi star at x of p is the location that I'm at. is going to have a value 5. So the total cost is 10 for staying. What if I move toward the goal? So what if I do this? Say I, I, you know, I'm considering this action. Is that, is that like, you know, I move from here to this state here. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Well, 
alpha at p minus 1 is going to be 1 plus 5. The state that I end up at is this. What's the value of this state? The value of the state is up there. It's 5. v of pi star at x of p is equal to 5. So this is 11. So it's better for me to stay. And if I do, I end up with 10 and 10. So what do we do? We computed the optimum policy for every one of our points. And my optimum policy is stay, 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 move toward goal, move toward goal, move toward goal. And the value of that policy is this. You notice that the value of the policy is not as good as the value at the last time point. So we're building up now our cost. The other thing that you notice is that whereas up there, look at the value of the policy there. It's uniform everywhere except at 0, right? Here, we begin now to see a gradient. So now this says that these places are going to have a, something better if you move toward the goal, whereas these faraway places are still going to be irrelevant. You don't want to move. So let's do it for one more time point. What is it with whiteboards that after a little while they become like completely unusable? There's some kind of a technology flaw, it seems to me. It's terrible. All right, so let's, let's begin. Let's, let's write down our, our, uh, our value function. So value of, of the best policy at time point x of p is 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 0, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. And this policy at this last time point is do nothing, do nothing, do nothing, do nothing. Do, not, uh, do nothing, stay, 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 stay. The value of the policy at time point p minus 1 is equal to, at each state, I have a value 6, 0, 6, 6, 6, 6, 10, 10. Right. And my policy at each of those states is stay, 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 move down, move to the goal, stay. So these are my actions, right? You see it? OK, let's do one more time point. So let's do time point p minus 2. See what happens. Let's pick one state. So um, let me pick this point here. Row 1, column 2. So let's pick an action. Action. So if I do nothing, then what happens is that my cost at this time point is just going to be 5, because that's the cost of my state. And then my value of where I'm going to end up with at time point p minus 1 is going to be my current state, which is 6. So this is going to cost me 11 of doing nothing. What about the action of moving down? So if I were to move down, my, my cost per step is going to be 1 plus 5. And my value, where I end up at, 
going to be zero because if I move down, that's the value of that state. So that's six. This is better. So what this tells me is that at time point p minus two, my best action is going to be For this one, it's going to be moved down. And the value is going to be equal to, I don't know what it is. Oh no, um, this is going to be 6. I'm going to have to fill the rest of it in. The same way as we're going to have to fill in the actions, we're going to have to fill in the value of the optimum policy. Um, what should we do next? What should we do next? Pick a state. Which row, which column? All right, so row four, column three. So. Um, this one here. Okay, so um, give me the action. Uh, diagonal. diagonal. Alpha at p minus 2 is equal to 1 plus state 5 is equal to 6, right? Value of the optimum policy at x p minus 1, where I end up at, so I end up at this state here, right? And that state has the value 6. That's 12. So is that better than the other choices that I have? I could move up, I could move left, or I could stay where I am. Right? Those are all the other options that I have. So let's, let's pick action, do nothing. Stay. Then I get alpha, p minus 2 is 5. This v is going to be ten, fifteen. Clearly, it's better for me to move now, right? Now, is it better to move to the left or is it better to move up to the to this point here? Is it is this? Should I move to this point or this point? This one. Either this or this. They're equal, equally good, right? So. It's going to be, this is going to be the best, best action to do. Say this one here. It's as good as to move up there, and the value is going to end up being um, 12. Do you see it? We break down the problem like this. And slowly, and it turns out that the, the best action for here is still is to stay. Because look what happens. If I stay at this point, I have 10 plus 5, which is the value of the, the, uh, the time per step, so I get 15. If I move, I get 10 plus 5 plus 1, which is 16. So it's better for me to stay. And the value is going to end up being 15. Yeah. No, I, I decided to stay, so I didn't have any action. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Was the, the, the other one is even worse. Yeah, it's like worse. Yeah, the sideways one is even worse. Yeah. So I think this ends up looking like this. So I want to stay here as well. This ends up costing me 15. Here, um, here, I think I want to move because it's going to cost me 5, 6, 16. Uh, so if I move, if, I, if, I, if I'm at this point, if I were to move up, it's just like this point. It makes it so that I go from um, uh, 1 plus 5 plus 6 is 11, 
and I believe that 6 is 6 is 12. So I think this is going to be 12, and this is going to be like this. All these others are going to be the same as before. This is going to be a 0. This is going to be 6, 6, 6, 6. No. No, no, no. So this is going to be, at this point, if I move up, I have um, 1 plus 5. Yeah, no, that's correct. That's correct. Let me check my, yeah, OK. And then um, at this point here, um, this point here, the question is, should I move? And I think if I move to this, this location, what I'm doing, let, let's consider that point. So this would be row 4, column 1. So if I stay. I have um, alpha p minus 2 is equal to 5. If I, um, and, uh, and then the value p minus 1 is going to be equal to um, 10. That's the 15. So if I go to this state, it's going to be 6 plus um, the value of the state that I end up at, which is 6, which is 12. So it's better for me to move there. Okay, so look at, look at how the value function changed. The value function at time point p was flat except at the, at the goal. At time point p minus 1, we have gradient that's one step away, and um, uh, uh, we see that there's now this gradient forms, and now this gradient has gotten bigger, and it's beginning to show a difference here. So eventually, what happens is that in the next time point, my best policy would be to move from here to here, stay, move from here to here, stay, and finally move from the last time point down. All right. So what did we do? We said the best action that you can do is to find the action that minimizes a cost. And that cost is composed of two things. The cost at the step that you're taking, the cost per step, that's cost of state, plus the state that you're at, it's going to cost you something. The action that you're going to take, is, and that's going to take you to some location. That location is going to have a value. That value is defined by the optimum policy from that state. So we did a deterministic system. If it was a stochastic system, it would just be the expected value rather than the value itself. 